Okay, we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. And um, stand with me. I'm going to read the first eight verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 1, finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And Lord, again, we're thankful for your word. We don't have to figure out life, Lord. You instruct us. You show us the way to go, and we thank you for that. And along with that, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your patience and your long-suffering in the learning process. We thank you how gentle you are. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you put up with us and you don't forsake us. You never leave us or forsake us. And we thank you that when we confess our sins, you are just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness Lord to just have that relationship restored in a moment's notice like that and you're always always with us Lord we thank you so bless this time we have now in your word we ask this in Jesus name amen you can be seated so the title of the message is set apart and so we we've been we've you know come here to chapter 4 1 Thessalonians, and if you remember, we've been looking all along with the Apostle Paul's concern for this young church, keeping in mind this young church was steeped in a pagan culture. And so he was also concerned that when they would hear reports of what was going on with them and their ministry, that they would misinterpret the events of their experience or the events of the life that the Apostle Paul was living for the Lord and the hardships that they would be enduring and the persecutions and the trials that they were encountering over and over again. But the Apostle Paul, he reassures them that this was something that didn't catch them by surprise. This was, as a matter of fact, was something that before he had left them, he even told them um, and reminded them that, that this would happen. Just a chapter back in chapter 3, verse 4. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know, and so Paul was trying to boast, you know, embolden their faith and their trust in all that would be taking place. And so Paul also informed them who was behind the scenes doing uh, these kinds of things. And as they're hearing about what would seem like a contradiction of faith, that you know, they would hear all these things and they would think, wow, well, if, you know, God was really with them, why would all these things be happening to them? And so, and so the enemy has ways of well-placing rumors that lack truth when he would try and undermine 
the people of God. And so Paul would reassure them that it was Satan who was behind what was taking place and it was him who was throwing the roadblocks in their way. And of course, he told uh, them that in chapter 2, verse 18, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. And we learn from that, that we understand from that, that God was working out his will in ways that sometimes are hard to understand. But we do know that because of that, Paul knew that Timothy could be sent to them, but not him. And so it's interesting because don't you think that Satan would have wanted to hinder Timothy from going to the church as well? Because he would be representing the word of God and truth and saying those things? Yeah. But Satan didn't have permission to stop Timothy from going to Thessalonica. But he did have permission to stop Paul from going for whatever reason. God was working out his will that is often hard to understand. <clears throat> but Paul did say to the church of Ephesus, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And so, you know, Paul would say, hey, you know, this is what's going on and this is who's behind it. Despite all the things that might seem that's behind it, besides that person and that person over there or the economy or the recession or whatever. It would seem like all that is behind the hindrances of our life, but no. If you're a believer, you're in a spiritual battle. We know who's behind it. Now, he uses all kinds of things in, in that, but isn't it reassuring to know that we can trust that we have power over the enemy? And uh, so it's trusting God and having confidence in God. So that needs to transcend our experiences and the confidence that we have in God needs to rest upon God's word, not our experiences. Because we tend to lean towards our experiences. And that's a, a downhill slope. Because one day you're feeling good, experiencing great things. And the next day you're feeling bad and experiencing bad things. But, you know, the Bible reassures us that unlike us and our experiences, God is unchanging He's always faithful, and he's always previous, always perfectly planned out. And so we can trust in the events of our life. James 1.17 tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Hebrews 13.8 uh, tells us Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. And so it's good to know in times of trials, these things, because then you can chill out. Not that it's that easy, you know. Uh, we're, we still got that human uh, element that is frail oftentimes. But, you know, when you gather yourself and, you know, you pray and you look to the Lord and then you, you know, you get so you talk to someone else who, who is able to encourage you and pray for you. You know, and you get through that bumpy, you have a place to go. You have a place to go. And that's so cool. You know, you can rest in, in the Lord. And, you know, and that goes also for our mountaintop experiences as well. Be aware God's will for us takes place in both arenas. Both arenas in our trials and in our mountaintop experiences. You know mountaintop experiences, right? You feel like you're just riding high. You know, whatever it is that makes you feel like you're riding high. Things seem to just fall into place. Smooth sailing. There's no fires to be put out right now. And, um, and we can get used to that, can't we? Matter of fact, we can even build our theology around that. Real easy. And that's where we have to be careful. And we forget about the healthy balance of how God works 
in our lives and how he builds us up so that we can then minister to others. And so now, don't get me wrong, enjoy your mountaintop experiences. Absolutely. You know, but just don't forget there's a healthy balance so you're not suddenly caught flat-footed and caught off guard and it kind of goes against your theology. You know, there's those theologies out there that tell, tell you, you know, positive confession it and, you know, if you're sick, if you're sick, it's because of sin and all these, you know, these false theologies that are out there. But remember, God, you know, works in all these, these two arenas. Now, someone once said to me, and something that resonates with me today, and that is that, that his fruit does, doesn't grow in the mountains, but in the valley. <clears throat> and that uh, is just so informative. And, you know, even look back at my own life, all that God's done, and how the fruit was born in the valleys. And, and, uh, but I added to that soon after he told me that, and, and I added that uh, the mountains provide the water that is necessary to the valley. And so it's times in those mountain experiences, you know, just be refreshed. Take it all in because, you know, you're going to need it when you're in the valley, <laughs> you know, to look, look back. And so um, there's a great application in Second Kings chapter 3 that we covered on Wednesday night. And that was where Elisha, he tells uh, the three kings who are desperate, you will not see the rain, he told them. But dig trenches out here in the desolate, dry place where you need water. Dig the trenches, and God will fill them up with water. You're not going to see the rain, but God will fill them up with water. And so in that chapter, there was just a great example of a blessed obedience. In dry and desperate times and in seasons like that, Put our keep keep to the plow, keep digging the trenches because God will be faithful to fill it with water, and that's exactly what happened. And you know, some of you might not be aware of that account. If you're not, read it later in Second Kings chapter three. So here in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, the subject that Paul addresses is the subject of morality. And also, later, which we won't get to, is he'll address the, the uh, subject of future events. But remember, the church in Thessalonica was a young church. The setting was a pagan setting, and um, in a pagan city, steeped in a pagan culture. And I remember when God was moving back in what was called the Jesus Revolution, and some of the testimonies that were coming from that, and how God was working, and how, you know, all of these, these young hippies and and lost young people were getting saved by the, the droves. It was amazing uh, what God was doing. And some of those testimonies was friends were inviting friends to church and they would hear the word and they would get saved. And then after they would get saved and the service would end, they'd say, this is so awesome. Hey, I've got some, a joint in the car. Let's go smoke it in celebration and and let's go find some girls or something like that. Ah, oh, well, we, we can't do that anymore. Why not? They didn't have a clue. You know, it wasn't like, you know, some of, the, some of them were like raised Catholic like I was, you know. I was raised Catholic. Nobody had to tell me that smoking marijuana was okay and sleeping around was okay and immorality and all that. I, I learned that. I had different problems. Like, what do you mean you can't pray to Mary? You know, what are you talking about? You know, you can't light a candle for Uncle Greedo that's in purgatory or whatever. You know, what are you talking about? Uh, what are we supposed to do with those guys? You know, I mean, I didn't know. I mean, you know, what, whatever. Can't pray to St. Anthony or St. Christopher or whatever. You can't, wait a minute. What about if I confess my sins? 
you telling me that I can't go to the confessional and talk to the priest? No, you just confess your sins. To, what, what are you talking about? I didn't learn that, you know. You know, the confessionals, I always used to make up things anyway when I used to go to that. <laughs> it's been 30 days since my last confession. It was probably more like six months, but I didn't have the guts to say six months. I, oh, it's been like 30 days since my last confession. Oh, yeah, and I, uh, then I started making up a bunch of stuff. And I knew to shorten that account so that I'd only have to say, oh, so many Our Fathers and so many Hail Marys and so many acts of contrition or whatever those prayers were. And I'd rattle them off and be on, on my way. But um, but what about the Jews? The Jews didn't have to be told, like we'll read here, of not to be involved with all this immorality. The Jews knew that. They had Leviticus 18. Read it later. It's very clear what they were to do and not to do. I mean, they had different issues like circumcision and the Sabbath day and blood sacrifice for the taking away of sins. I mean, they had their own, their own list of things, but not this. And you would think, well, why is this list given? Well, these are pagans who worshipped in immorality. These, are, these are, are people who came out of that. And so, and so Paul is addressing it. And apparently, you know, word got back to him that Things were not quite uh, right. And so the first two verses, you know, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. And so he had, they had already um, told them these things. And, and so... And he said, finally, you know, as, as Paul is addressing them and, you know, we're getting to chapter four in the letter, it's almost like he crested the top and he's headed down the backside of a mountain. This is a transition where he's dealing with other, other things. It's not really a conclusion. But Paul here will deal, deal with the practical matters of Christian living. And he uses two strong words here. Um, that uh, he's urging and exhorting them. He's pleading with them concerning this subject, and he's also admonishing the church. He's warning the church. Because once they become responsible for what they know to be correct, and then they reject it, that's a different issue altogether. So he's admonishing the church, and that will require obedience on their part. And so Paul, in a similar way, when he was writing to the church of Ephesus, which was also steeped in paganism and so forth, and uh, he put it this way in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 17 um, and on, he says, This I say therefore and testify to the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in the spirit, that you put off concerning your former conduct that the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so, you know, he stressed there, if indeed you had heard him and if you're taught by him. And so... The bottom line is we can trust the, the Holy Spirit to make known to us the things that are correct and exactly give us the power to be overcomers. We, we don't have any excuses. Whereas before we were saved, we had no power over these things. We had no power. You know, it's just like, you know, I mentioned when I was a Catholic. I mean, yeah, I could, I could know all these things, but I mean, whether I agreed with them or whether I could not do them or, or anything, it just wasn't, to me, it wasn't an issue. You know, but here Paul's saying, yeah, it's, it's an issue, okay. You know, and then he says there, just as you receive from me. You know, we, we've already communicated this um, to you, and you know 
what commandments we gave you. He says there in verse 2. And then in verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you uh, should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel. That's that, this physical body in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. You know, they don't know God, so they're just doing their own thing. And, you know, of course, addressing the, the pagan culture, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this uh, matter because the, the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarn you and, test, and testify. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And there's that accountability. He's given us his Holy Spirit. There is no excuse for that. That word sanctification, it speaks of a progression, a lifelong pursuit, the sanctification. You know, it's moving away from the lifelong imperfections dealing with that practical living. And this is as we are responding to the work that God's doing in us. This isn't us being able to muster it up. This is God doing the work. As a matter of fact, when he's uh, getting near the end of this First Thessalonians in, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 5, verse 23, he makes reference to that. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's God who is doing the work in us to be able to be sanctified. And now remember, this ain't the subject of positional sanctification. Positional sanctification means is that when you receive Christ in your heart, when you're born again, and, you, and, and you, the next step you get hit by a car, you're taken right up into heaven completely 100% sanctified, ready for heaven because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's positional sanctification. But this here is practical sanctification. And as time is afforded us, that's worked out in our lives, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's practical sanctification. It's responding to the things that were taught. And, and so he says... Um, abstain from sexual immorality. And so uh, apparent, uh, uh, it was an apparent issue that being that they came from a pagan religion that they would have indulged in sexual immorality as part of how they would worship their many gods. And so this is uh, completely flipped for them as far as the way that they would be living and so and so um, and then if you look there again in in, in verse uh, 6 you know he says they're not uh, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because of uh, because the Lord is the avenger of such and that they're forewarned and so in and amongst their culture, the immorality was a shared lifestyle and something that they would just be indulged in. And, and, uh, and so he's warning Christians about that. And so you notice it's not really spelled out here, but it's um, the immoral activities that he's referencing that would destroy relationships and hurt others and, of course, would really uh, destroy the, the church atmosphere as God would have it. And so it's a heavy issue, but I like the fact, uh, I don't know if that's the correct wording, but uh, I understand the fact that the details of, of what he's talking about is not really spelled out because it would take too much to talk about what he's talking about. But the message is clear to how many ways that there could be an interference uh, in uh, the church. But notice, he's, he, he quickly says, because the Lord is the avenger. And so if this continues to happen, and once again, speaking to the church, God will not and does not turn a blind eye concerning immorality. What is sexual immorality? Illicit sexual intercourse. 
including but not limited to adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, etc., any sexual activity outside of marriage. And I should specify biblical God-approved marriage, which is between a man, biological male, and a woman, biological female. And it's sad that, you know, nowadays that you'd have to add that extra bit of information because of the world we live in. But it's the same thing. Things haven't changed. It's the same in Paul's day. And they didn't think anything of homosexuality. They didn't even think of anything of, of sex with children. That was on the table. Uh, you know, uh, it, w- it was, I don't want to say it was worse than it is now because even, you know, then it was just an accepted across the board in, 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 in the, in the entire um, culture, but here um, it's not our entire culture. And now there is, um, you know, uh, a big, bigger, growing group, but it's not accepted in our entire country, you know. But uh, you know, here, here we're looking at a city that all of this was uh, accepted. So, but God is the avenger, and so you're forewarned. So again, you've, you've been informed. Now this is being stressed for your well-being. It's being stressed. It's amazing God's patience with us and God's um, love for us. For God did not call us to uncleanness. That word that he uses there in verse 7 is a word that covers a broader range. Um, Not only sexual immorality, but also lusting for luxurious living, wasteful and reckless, extravagant living. Or rather, we are called to holiness. And so we live set-apart lives to honor and obey the Lord. And so we have to be on guard with this in mind. We have to be on guard not to, to long to always be pampered and comfortable, especially here in the great U.S. of A. Um, we are, whether you know it or not, elites in the world scene. Elitists because of the way we live. You can deny that category, but that's where, that's where you're at. But beware. Beware to get to the place where you forfeit a servant's heart. Because we are to follow the example of Jesus Christ. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. That's the same word used in verse 3, sanctification. Same Greek word. Translated sanctification, verse 3, and holiness here, verse 7. Being set apart, therefore, he who rejects this, then we're, in other words, you know, everything that he's saying, if, you, if, if you're in a place where you reject this, you know, you might be that person that says, hey, you need to sleep, sleep around, you know, first to see if you're compatible. You, you'd be rejecting um, this and um, because immorality is incompatible with the relationship with Jesus Christ it's incompatible but yet there's that idea out there but really what is compatibility from a Christian standpoint compatibility is a blessing that God is able to establish to enhance and to give endurance to to the believer. That's what compatibility is from a Christian standpoint. We trust God for that. Now the world sends a different message. The world says, let's make sure we're compatible in the flesh. That doesn't last. Compatible in the flesh. God says no. Rather, we need to be compatible in the spirit. We let God take care of our lives in every way possible. You know, we trust him to bless us supernaturally. You start off life that way, you see God doesn't change. God never changes. That's the foundation to have. And so, um, and so, you know, we have, and so those who would think contrary, um, 
really brings judgment. Paul wrote to the church of Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the, the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And so there's uh, accountability to those things. And so, and then, after dealing with what would be a contradiction to God's love, you know, um, then he talks about brotherly love. So he does that, and he starts there at verse 9, notice, but concerning brotherly love. And I want to make mention here that uh, I think is important. You notice that the Apostle Paul didn't harp on all that stuff we just went over. He didn't harp on it. He just spoke it out there and said, this is the way it is. This is the word of, of correction. And I, I think we should learn a lesson here because after we correct and we're clear, then like what will happen here, the Holy Spirit will drive the message home. I think people make the mistake of trying to be the Holy Spirit. And we need to trust the Holy Spirit. When people try and be the Holy Spirit, it's because they're not trusting the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can, can. We can do. You know, we put it out there. That's what we're responsible to do. But then, if the hearer rejects it, and I'm speaking about the church here, and so if the believer rejects God's counsel, then the Holy Spirit brings them to the woodshed. And he's the one that applies the necessary pressure in a person's life uh, that's needed. Because he, he has a perfect view of eternity. And so, you know, to carry the message even further like that, you know, and to become what we, I'd call a broken record. I don't know if that's understood today by the younger crowd, what a broken record is. You know, just, you know, it gets stuck in one place, you know, and keep playing the same, and you'd have to, like, go up and look for the scratch or something. But, you know, it's, it's like that. And somehow we think that we're going to be more effective if we're like the broken record. And that's not true. It's just not true. Matter of fact, we see it exemplified here because the subject matter that he was dealing with, you think, man, he had pounded for pages on the issues. But no. You know, the pounding that needs to be taken place is by the Holy Spirit. And a simple word given is all you need. Speak the truth. So now he's going to talk about brotherly love. And he says, You have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And this is comforting to me. We have the greatest teacher to teach us about love. God has taught us and is teaching us. Why? First John tells us, Chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Jesus talks about the new commandment of love, and Jesus demonstrated God's love for us. And Jesus says, do it because I've done it. Look at, look at me, Jesus said in John 13. So when he had washed their feet, took in that lowest place of a servant and washed feet, and um, taking his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If, then, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you, Jesus Christ. You know, are, are we, um, you know, are we of the sort of entitle, entitlement um, way of thinking? You know, well, you're a distance from the way that Jesus taught us. Jesus taught us, you know. And then we see verse 10, and indeed, 
you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And what he's saying, you know, basically, though, the subject of sanctification is that we're not going to arrive on earth. You know, we're never going to arrive. But if we're not growing as a believer, then we're going to have issues. We are to in increase until heaven. And the word increase there means an adding to and a maturing to our walk. You know, it makes me think of what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, where he writes, or 2 Peter chapter 1, where he writes, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the, the knowledge of, of God and of Jesus Christ. That's why we study the word. And in his divine power, uh, as given to us, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us uh, by glory and virtue. That's the power of the Holy Spirit by which, by, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of divine nature, being, um, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control. Self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not, he's not saying you're going to be adding to being more saved. No, he's talking about sanctification, and we need to be maturing and growing. Apostle Paul, when dealing with that, or I say Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews, but we don't know that for sure. But in Hebrews 5, it tells us, for, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that those who, by reason of use, having their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, by reason of use. So you learn those things, you put them into practice, no, never perfectly. But the thing is, is you're trying to say, okay, Lord, this is what you show me, help me to do this. And when you do that, he'll help you to do that. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes, um, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal but as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And so, you know, there's that confronting of those who are not growing in the Lord, that, can't, that are not exercising the things of the Lord. And so it would just indicate those who have not been growing, instead remaining non-responsive. And then, of course, issues follow that. All kinds of issues that, you know, people might have because they're not exercising the things of the Lord. And so he says that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly toward those who are on the outside and that you may lack nothing. And so he's dealing with basic issues, uh, aspiring to lead a quiet life. It's speaking of striving, studying how to do that. It requires discipline and effort and diligence to, 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 lead, to lead a quiet life. You know, you're not just a loose cannon so to speak. Um, a quiet life as opposed to being an instigator of trouble is the idea. You know, some people are busybodies. Loud mouths. They stir up unrest. They create issues. They're a problem in the name of Jesus, they say. But, but what about the balance? How do you keep a balance? And this is how you keep a balance. You share the good news. You speak the truth in love. You know, you're not vindictive like so many who supposedly are speaking for Jesus are just so vindictive in their way of doing it. 
The Apostle Paul, he was a pastor, he was a preacher, he was an evangelist, he was a missionary, and yet he was not derailed from keeping his course and sharing the truth. And yeah, I wouldn't say, you know, under that definition that the Apostle Paul lived a quiet life because it seemed like everywhere he went, there was, you know, problems and issues and all that stuff. But this is speaking about those who just cause problems and it's because they're, they're a problem. But we're to live a quiet life. Mind your own business. It means to keep to the work that God has given you. Pray for those who you think should do theirs better. I mean, when I look at it, I have enough of my own plate. I don't need to be looking at you and telling you how to do yours better. You know, and, uh, and, and that, you know, minding my own business. I have enough to deal with. And, you know, he says, you know, and, and to work with your own hands. And why is that? Well, because the idleness is a playground of the devil. It's a place where the devil really works. And remember what Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica in the, in the second uh, letter, third, third chapter, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if Anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So Paul confronted those. Somehow or another, they just think that they don't have to work. Well, we all have to work in the, order, in the proper order of obedience to Jesus Christ. We have to, to work. And so, you know, uh, stressing speaks of able-bodied man or woman should work. And, and then if, if a man or woman is limited, they should work to their capacity. One way or another, acti- active. You know, and if you're confined to a bed, work, pray, you know. Um, but just don't be lazy. You know, people get lazy in their minds as well. No, we should be excited about the coming of the Lord and whatever your situation is. And so, and notice, this is a command. It's a non-negotiable, you know, uh, to work with your own hands as we commanded, commanded you. And this is in the order of God. And then lastly, in verse 12, um, that you may walk properly. And so that's being a good example. You know, those living in the world, being a good example to those that are not believers, those of us living for Jesus have a blessed life. Is that what you're portraying? Because it's true. If you're living for Jesus, it's true. You're a blessed person. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior and the hope of heaven, you're a blessed person. Hopefully you convey that. Hopefully you send that message. And a blessed life draws attention. Draws attention. If you look like you've been, you know, sucking on a sour lemon. Matter of fact, I should, shouldn't say that. Some people just can't help their countenance. Um, pastor, when I was in, a pastor when I was uh, helping uh, down in Southern California in Lake Elsinore for 10 years, uh, one brother finally said to him, like, he goes, John, do you, do you like being a pastor? And John goes, oh, yeah. He goes, well, why don't you tell your face the, you know, tell your face that, you know. Well, he couldn't help it. He was just real somber looking. But man, he just loved Jesus and was a great teacher and everything. He just, it didn't show on his face um, at all. So I, and so I shouldn't say that. But when people hear what you have to say, you know, is it giving glory to the Lord? You know, it should draw attention. Um, you know, those who are seeking and searching, when given opportunity, can the Lord send somebody your way? You know, and the final word there is, um, notice God provides what we need. Where God guides, he provides. My pastor told me that when I was just a new believer. And I watched God, my family has experienced and enjoyed the blessings and the wonders of the Lord. And God has been faithful. And so, you know, once again, I'm encouraged uh, by this word because, you know, you or I, you know, you, you and I would probably be so frustrated 
to see, you know, a church that would be otherwise compromising in the worst kinds of areas where you, would, you and I would look and say, how could that happen? But yet the word is simply given and then even with affirmation when we read the first couple of chapters of how God is doing a work and now be separated completely. You and I would want, you know, start telling them how they're condemned and they're going to hell and, you know, how if you were really a Christian, you would never do that and this and, you know, condemnation we would hurl and judgment. God doesn't work that way. God says, okay, look where they're coming from. They're just little, just like having a little infant. How do you treat a little infant as a responsible parent? What? You're six months old and you dirtied your diaper again? Get out of it. Bam, bam, bam. You no, know, is something wrong with you. Something would be terribly wrong with you if you did that. And so, but that's the way we would treat people rather than seeing them for what God's doing in their lives. We'd be so self-righteous if you're not, you know, my pastor was called to do what he did to lead that Jesus revolution and to deal with the people that came out of that. Do you know why? Because he also wrote a book that says, Grace Changes Everything. It's been 25 years, 30 years since I read it. But he was able to write that book because he knew about the grace of God. We need to be all about that. All about that. Amen. Let's stand together. Come up forward if you want prayer afterwards, okay? Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your long suffering for us, Lord. We're just amazed. Help us to extend that grace to others, Lord, when you know, maybe we think they should be in a different place than they're really at. Well, we don't really have enough information. We don't really have enough knowledge. We don't know where they've come from. We don't know what they've been taught. We don't know the abuse that we've never had to experience. We don't know any of that, Lord. So we have no right. So help us, Lord, to just communicate the truth uh, and then to trust you for the work that goes on. So we look to you now. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us. I pray for all that are here and ask for your blessing upon them today, Lord, and all that they're dealing with. Fill us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.